to the 72 PC podcast, the only podcast where you can join the conversation and the game. With us this week, we have Eric. Yo. And we have Tom, who is pouring a lot of coffee. I am pouring a ton of coffee. Look at this thing. <laughs> it's a big, beautiful carafe full of delicious coffee. Oh, she's a beaut. She's a beaut. Mm. Don't you know? Oh my god, it's so good. You guys ever seen that really stupid Nietzsche walk video? On YouTube? Nietzsche walk? Nietzsche walk? No. No? You haven't seen that? No. It's so nah. dumb. It's just like this little home video of this, this guy and his friend uh, pretending to do like this nature show thing. And, and it's just, he's like really awkward and nerdy and it's just really dumb, but it's funny. And it's got like all the bad, like early 2000s. I don't know how to video edit stock transition, like just stuff. <laughs> And he's like, just does like, it do a star wipe at any one point? <laughs> I, I think it does. <laughs> nice. Or but, like it play, the blind but it plays this dumb music shit. beginning. We're like, hi, right, we made nature walk to show everybody how, how neat nature is. And so just me and Rodney knowing it. And then it cuts to him. He's like, that's how neat is that? And it cuts to another footage. And he's like, that's pretty neat. And it just keeps. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, it's just really, really dumb. You have to see it. <laughs> It's such a good video. Really dumb. Such high, such high, high uh, standards to go yeah. see. Yeah. Yep. Makes me. It's okay. a good dumb. It's funny Some... dumb. Like it's. it's so wholesome. there's something else that's supposed cheesy. to be funny dumb that I really didn't enjoy, but I guess some people do. Have mm -hmm. you ever seen Trailer Park Boys? Yeah, I like Trailer I Park not. Boys. It's one of yeah, those shows it's... where I I watched an episode and I'm like. I don't, I don't know if I really liked that. And then I watched another episode and I'm like, I don't know if I really liked that. And I watched another episode. And I'm like, uh, was, I don't know if I really liked that that much. And then like 10 <laughs> episodes later, I'm like, you know what? I think I liked it actually. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I, I, I couldn't stay with it. So um, a friend of mine's wife introduced me to this show. She's like, oh, this is awesome. And she made me watch it and I just, couldn't stand it. <laughs> That's fair. So I returned fire by making her watch Aqua Teen, which well, we've, yeah, or, that's, we've, yeah, we've, we've discussed that. that show enough. Yeah, Everyone yeah. understands our stances, but that but was my retaliation. But I think the, the appeal of Trailer Park Boys is pretty similar to that. The appeal or the um, you just don't like it at first kind of thing. Maybe both. I don't know. It's, I don't know. It's just one of those things. And, and there's a lot of like dumb little subtle stuff in the show too that, that's funny if you pick up on it, but it's like, I don't know. It's still just like lowbrow dumb entertainment. I mean, I don't know. There's nothing wrong with that. I don't, I'm not saying that as a negative thing. I'm just saying it's like a, it's a, yeah. it's, a it's a dumb show. Like it's, it's goofy and kinda, funny. Kind of like this shitty gaming podcast that I love. Yeah. Where three guys mostly just discuss food. And they don't ever talk about video games. Like you can just fast forward half the podcast, really. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> we haven't really done too terrible. I, I feel our food balance has been decent now. It has. A little bit. It hasn't been yeah. stupid. <laughs> when Navi says The Crown Aqua isn't King. a bad show, I'm not sure if I've heard of The Crown. Is that the one about, like, everybody uh, is queen. obsessed with Henry the... Okay, then no, it's not no, the it's Henry about the the queen. show. Okay. No, no, no. It's about the queen and from her coronation to be queen up until present. It's a pretty good show. Gina and I had a deal where if I watched all of that, she would watch all of Aqua Teen. I've oh, watched yeah. three seasons of The Crown. She's watched a half season of Aqua Teen. I feel I'm getting gypped in this deal. <laughs> uh, maybe. Maybe. I mean, how long is the season of Aqua Teen compared to a season of The Crown? Like how many? Ten how hour many? or ten episodes an hour each for the crown. That is oh, longer okay. than an Aqua Teen season. Yeah, you're getting the yeah. wrong Aqu deal. Aqua Teen season's like twenty episodes, fifteen a piece. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know uh, about that one, Eric. <laughs> yeah, Renee and I have made a similar deal where I will read uh, and Rand, uh, and she will play through all of the Half Life games. And I'm thinking, ah, ha, ha, that's like sixty hours of games. She's probably gonna have to read a tiny book. No, it's like a thousand time out. pages. It's time out. You, you're not familiar with Anne Rand's books. There's only one of them no. that is short. Anthem yeah. is the only short one. 
Yeah, no, it's one I not like. Anthem. <laughs> I, I enjoyed um, Atlas Shrugged. I really You did. know, I bought yeah. Atlas Shrugged at a used bookstore for like $3. And I was like, oh, wow. This, you know, classic everybody loves. And it's Ooh. only $3. I'm going to read it. And then I started reading it. And I was like, this is kind of interesting. I got about 100, 200 pages into it. And then I, I looked at the side of the book and realized that I wasn't even like <laughs> a hundredth of the way through the book. And I was like, yeah. no, I the don't The book think doesn't so. actually <laughs> really start hitting full tilt until it's like, like uh, a third of the way through. Ain't nobody got time for that. Yeah, like it's 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 good. It, like I'm I'm enjoying this book so far. Um, and the, the mark of a good book to me is like if a character can make me like actually angry. It was like, but that's so fucking stupid. Why would they fucking do that? Like, those idiots, they know it means this, right? And Renee's like, yeah, that's how you're supposed to feel. I'm like, shit. Fuck this author and her good writing. <laughs> making me feel things. How dare you? How dare you make me feel feelings? <laughs> that's how I feel about story games. How dare you? How dare you? But, uh, that's but why yeah, I haven't I think finished uh, Last of Us 2. I think I'm getting a, a raw deal on uh, the amount of hours uh, sp <laughs> spending. Oh, yeah, uh, you are. Reading Atlas Shrugged versus Half Life. Yeah, unless you're a crazy no, quick no. reader. Like, yeah, Comrade Bunny says 160. Nah, I'm actually like 250 now. I've been reading and haven't been telling oh. you. <laughs> hey, so you started with Atlas Shrugged? Yeah, you didn't start with the easy one. You like no. jumped into probably her most known. I it, I was requested to read Atlas Shrugged specifically. Oh, mm. just that? You don't have to read all of her? No. Oh, in that case, you might actually win this deal you sure Half yeah because fountainhead's even like fountainhead's even bigger than atlas shrug that's why i was thinking you're screwed oh my gosh how is it bigger how <laughs> how it's like a goddamn tome i think it's like 100 <laughs> pages longer or something like that oh okay we'll probably get through the bible atlas quicker than you could shrug. atlas shrugged I, I was pretty sure fountainhead was her biggest but either way it's either way it is sizable it is not a small thing. God damn. Anyway, um, enough about Ayn Rand. What you guys up to outside of Tom uh, Reed and Ayn Rand? Playing yeah, off, Rocket League. Yeah. I've been off work all week, so that was fantastic. It was a really good week. Nice. 10, out, 10 out of 10. I didn't do, do shit. Do anything. No. I didn't I was do, anything. Ask, do anything different. <laughs> I didn't do anything. You stayed up playing Ghost Hunter with me. I did. Way yeah, more we than what a we ton normally of that. Oh my God phasmophobia i am okay fuck with it. That game. let's just get into we're, it we're getting yeah. into it i'm sure we'll get off that... topic later and we can pad the pad the yeah. podcast out a little longer <laughs> <laughs> let's be honest we're not trying to pass, but, um that game is awesome Dude. yeah it is yeah so, so last go ahead, last uh last week on the podcast tom i think is the one that that brought it up he played it before we did and he was like yeah it's this multiplayer horror uh you know ghost hunter investigative detective game hey that sounds fun i'll go ahead and buy that and we ended up playing it after the podcast hey that was a lot of fun eric played it in vr um and then the next day we we kind of woke up in the morning and we like oh let's let's check that game out again <laughs> hey i'll stream some of that game and we played and then we played and then 13 hours later the stream Literally. ends. 13 hour fucking <laughs> 13 stream. hours later, we stopped playing that game. So, <laughs> needless to say, we were hooked. And yeah. that momentum, I mean, we didn't play 13 hours every day. But, I mean, nah. that momentum did not stop much the whole week. So, between the last podcast and this podcast, I have 40 hours in that game. And, and I I'm think Eric is like sitting 35? at 30. Yeah, 35. So we we've, um, we've been in it. We've been in it a lot. I'm checking mine. I know mine's lower than both of you. Yeah, I didn't I've got even 17. play today. Yeah, I didn't play today. And, okay, Tom, you have the right amount for a person who's been playing a game a lot. Yeah, in a <laughs> yeah, week, seventeen yeah. hours, you sounds, have the right amount. Sir. That sounds about right. But no, the game is just um, it's it's just this perfect blend of first off novelty because. There aren't, I mean, I guess there are some, but there's not a lot of multiplayer horror games or anything with that that kind of spooky vibe for multiplayer. And two, even if you strip that away and you strip away the cool atmosphere and the theme, like just the puzzle detective aspect of that game is fun. 
Um, it, it's cool that it's not always just step one, step two, step three, thing is done. It's, you know, step one might work. Oh, that's not working. Let's try something else. And there are, there are a lot of tools in the game that I think allow for multiple play styles. Like, you don't just have to do these things to win. You can choose to prioritize, uh, like, sensors and stuff. You can choose to set up a bunch of cameras and try to be in the house as little as possible. You can prioritize just getting in there. And if a hunt happens, you run and you're just in it the whole time. Like, there's, there's just a lot... It's, it's not like it's not as in depth as it could be, right? But it's in depth enough that gives it variety and replayability. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's it's something that I haven't really experienced in a multiplayer game. Like I know that we've tried doing some games that had some unique multiplayer, but this is just you can give everyone a task, and then you just don't see the person again. <laughs> like they could end up fucking dying. It's just, Ooh. I don't know. This this game's got me in a way that I haven't been hooked in some time. I really, 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 really fucking appreciate the way that the different tools are working. So you'll find that as you're starting to play stuff like a sound sensor, it's like, what the fuck do I need it for? It's expensive. I don't use it. We've graduated to the point where if we're going to asylum, yeah, that's right. We will hit up asylum we max out our sensors. Like we are going in with four sensors of each every time. And, and head mounted cameras and motion detectors and everything. So it's, it's really fun to see how the game changes from when you, you know, you haven't played it much to you've played it a lot. And there's just some huge differences in the way you approach it. As well as there's, there comes a slight desensitization of the horror aspect. I mean, with time, that happens. So you find yourself also being more ballsy. You're trying to stretch it out a little more. You might stick around and try to get that last bit of evidence more than what you normally would. So you find yourself in those kind of scenarios, which I find really, really enjoyable. Yeah, for sure. And for those who weren't here during last week's podcast when we kind of introduced the game and its core concepts. Um, if you've ever seen those uh, like ghost hunter shows on the sci-fi channel, um, it's, bas really it's basically that. Awful right. ones. Yeah. <laughs> um, you have a team of up to four players and a handful of locations. Uh, use the tools to scope out the house, find the location of the, the ghost room where the ghost likes to hang out the most. And then you have to figure out what kind of ghost it is by, um, finding evidence of certain phenomenon and then narrowing that down into these these ghosts that have their own identities and behaviors and giveaways. So one thing, one thing that's been screwing me over in this game is that we got used to the ghost only being in one room. Mm -hmm. And on, a, on like the low difficulties, that's generally the case, right? Or almost yeah. always the case, really. Yeah. yeah, Is that the ghost will haunt one place. So once you find the room, you're done. You just have to gather evidence at that point. We were playing, um, I think it was high school last night on Intermediate, and we had a roamer. And it's a ghost that literally, like, it picks a few rooms and it wanders between them. So we couldn't actually narrow down where this thing was. And we spent our whole time trying to find the one room and then completely missing that the ghost was just roaming the hallway the whole fucking time. <laughs> Um, so you really have to be on your game when you yeah. get up into these higher difficulties, which is greatly appreciated. It keeps things very interesting. Yeah. On those so ones I'm where... Sh Go ahead. Go ahead. I'll say, I'm pretty sure the ghost still technically has one room, but multiple rooms will start seeing effects. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. there'll be situations where you'll see, oh, this one has a low temperature reading. You'll go to the room right next to it. It also has a low temperature reading. So you know he's in that area, mm -hmm. but you still don't know what his room is, which is important for things like a um, ghost riding because you have mm -hmm. to be in pretty good proximity to him. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I like that aspect of uncertainty and inconsistency. It's it's intentional inconsistency. It's not like bug bugginess. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not that the game doesn't have bugginess. We'll get to that in a little bit. But um, it adds this dimension of, okay, we're not getting this one piece of evidence. But we can't rule that out yet because we might get it later or it might not show yes. up at all. But that doesn't mean it's not the right ghost. 
each ghost has its own like set of behaviors and then when you're playing on like the higher difficulties you might never get all three pieces of evidence you need to like 100 percent verify it is this type of ghost you might get two out of three evidences and there are two or three ghosts it could be and you have to deduce which one you think it is based on the behavior of the ghost right um for example a demon will attack way more often than all the other types of ghosts um, yeah. A shade will be kind of shy and it'll only really show itself if there's one person in the room at the time. Or, you know, another type of ghost might like it when the lights are off or the poltergeist likes to throw stuff around the room a lot. So you can you can narrow down these these ghosts based off their behavior. And it's not just this, you know, oh, these boxes are checked. This is the thing. And we're 100 percent certain of it. Mm. I, it adds, and I, that's the depth I enjoy about the game. And I feel they did a great job in the game of stepping up the difficulties because in the lower yeah, difficulty, it absolutely is what you said. Get evidence one, two, three, done. Yeah, and every once in a while, you'll be worried about, oh, well, it might be a demon, so we might get attacked. So you're starting to become aware of the stuff. Intermediate, you know, every once in a while, you won't get all three and you have to deduce, but you'll still get all three most of the time. Mm -hmm. But then when you get pro, add, uh, this is always going to be my fucking case i explained this with adam and i were running a pro run he dies 20 minutes in and we only have one evidence <laughs> by the 40 minute mark i had finally gotten the second evidence mm -hmm. 40 Jesus. minutes to get a second confirmed evidence <clears throat> yep and so um, i mean they they intentionally want you to not get all the evidence and hire things yeah exactly and uh another part of the game i really really enjoy is the the voice the voice stuff oh it's so good um, so we talked about this a little bit in the last cast too i think but um like alien isolation back in the day right it measured your actual voice input so if you're hiding from the alien and you make noise like you're scared or you scream or something it'll hear you and find you in the game so this game does something very similar um your your mic is always on to the game so they can hear uh, the ghost will hear you and it has uh, voice recognition lines like you can ask give us a sign and the ghost may choose to respond by um, throwing something around the room or showing itself for a second or flickering the lights um, where are you it might show itself there's there's these lists of phrases that the game will recognize that the ghost may or may not respond to and much like alien isolation if the ghost is in a hunt phase which means it's attacking you and you have to hide if you make noise even if you're in a great hiding spot, it's it's going to find you and it's going to kill you. And some of these ghosts will travel great length to make that kill. Yeah. Yeah, they will. I watched, I watched one come from the farthest point upstairs, around the entire upstairs, down the stairs, to the farthest part and the lower stairs to kill Adam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah I mean, they will sometimes they will hone in on one person, depending on what type of ghost it is or whatever. Mm. Um, but... The game isn't without its faults, right? Um, so from what I understand, there is literally one developer. So it's this guy, and he made the game. So a lot of this stuff is pretty um, forgivable, right? But there are some bugs yeah. in the game. Um, there have been instances of like player clipping through doorways weird to where the ghost can still get you even though you're outside of the house. Um, or some, dropping some of the, equipment in locations where you can't pick it up afterwards. Yes. Yeah, or, occasionally something like that. Or in VR, getting clipped into a wall and being locked in there for five yeah. minutes. Yep. <laughs> that was um, fun. Every once in a while, one of the like ghosts, like the evidences, like one of the tools or something won't work very well. Um, not too much. <laughs> Rob says, I feel attacked. Yeah, we brought him. Hey, you Tell know the what? story. Tell that's the story. A, that's a valid bug. Okay, so we're, we're on the single story house. Um, everybody gets outside. And I think maybe one person was in there, but he had a hiding spot. Fine. Um, the hunt happens. So I'm outside the window looking in and I can see the ghost, you know, roaming around and blinking in and out. Super creepy. Very cool. Rob is right outside the front door. Now, if you're outside the, the house, you're safe, right? The ghost doesn't come outside. So Rob's right outside the front door looking in the little side window. And this ghost starts walking towards the door. And this ghost kills Rob through the front door of the house. That is not supposed to happen. <laughs> and it, I mean, I would be I would be mad too. I mean, that was just complete and utter <laughs> shenanigans. It was kind of weird. Like we're just watching Rob stand outside of this house. Yep. 
getting strangled. Yep. And also something I don't know if we actually talked about last week because I don't know how much time it actually played. But for the love of God, there is such a threshold of relief when you walk out that door. <laughs> oh, my so, God. Like it's when you're trying night. to get out the door, when the hunt phase starts, it will lock you in the house and you can't get mm-hmm. out. So once that front door shuts, you're stuck. So as you're approaching the front door, the whole time you're thinking internally, please don't, don't close, don't Please close, don't, don't start close. hunting. Yep. Please don't start hunting. Because it happens so often. You'll be sitting there and you'll be like, okay, that's it. There's the door. We're we're cool. We got all the evidences. We took pictures of like uh, dirty water in a sink. I'm ready to leave. And you get to the door, slam, <laughs> slams right in your fucking face. And you're like, no, no. And then you die. That happened to me the other day too. <laughs> I had one happen yesterday, I think it was, where Adam and I, he was right behind me. Yeah. And literally, I'm. we're just walking. I get out and then I hear a click. I'm like, oh no. I turn around. <laughs> the door closed between us and locked him in on a hunt. It was me, you, and I think Jonathan were playing. And you yeah. two were ahead of me. And I was, right, I mean, I was right behind them. Like, if this was real life, I could reach out with my arm and touch their shoulder. But the door <laughs> shuts on me. And I hear Eric go, oh no, Adam didn't get out. So I'm like, <laughs> I'm running to this side room to try to get some cover and hide behind in this room. I shut the door behind me. And there's the big window on the side. And I hear Eric and John walk across the side of the house. I hear their footsteps and I hear, all right, let's somebody get the popcorn out because they could see me in the window hiding. Like, let's see if he's about to get, you know, murked by this ghost or not. And we had our cameras out. Got a yeah, perfect picture of Adam where he's yeah, looking I, up I at us. I turn around crouch. to look at the window to see if they're out there. And Eric's snapping pictures in at me. <laughs> I love that because I, I love like on on the houses like they're just suburban standard houses and like I'll walk up with like a flashlight and just be peering in and then you'll you'll hear like somebody over the radio say Shh, we got level 10 on the activity get the fuck out of there guys and then you see like like people running towards the door and the ghost like behind them like phasing in and out of existence it's like <laughs> oh shit oh shit and like you're outside the window what are you gonna do? You can yeah. scream at them, but there's there's nothing nothing you can do. It's just gonna it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah. This, this game had so many notes, and it's early access, and I'm really excited about that. Yeah. yeah, because this game is set up in a way where adding a new just a new house would add a ton of replayability. Yeah, adding new equipment would be huge. Oh man, that's gonna be nuts. And adding a new ghost. Just to have new combinations oh of this God, plus a that. New ghost with some new just a to read single it. ghost. Yeah, yeah. And there's there. Nuts. I think right now there are enough types of ghosts. I can't remember how many exactly, but there are enough types of ghosts that it it doesn't get repetitive too much. I, I'm I'm feeling a little burned, but that's also yeah, we also part like of, went I've all in it. for an entire week. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so like I'm still enjoying it. Like yeah. I'm I'm probably gonna play it after cast tonight. But it, I'm definitely feeling that I'll probably be with it for about another week. Maybe after Halloween, I'll definitely be done with it, probably mm-hmm. until yeah, more content. For sure. So uh, I have only been playing this in VR. And I got to say, I can only put so many hours in, mostly because after standing for so long, my feet hurt. Oh, but yeah. uh, it is, it, it literally feels physically exhausting. So when I, I notice that when I take my hands out of the index controllers, my hands hurt. They're red. They hurt because I'm like white knuckling those motherfuckers. Yeah. <laughs> like I'm, I'm scared. I'm holding on for dear life. And we just got to get out of that house. And playing like four hours of that in VR in that like tensed up state. Yeah. It's kind of sure tiring. It, I'm sure the game is much more um, intense and immersive in VR. I will yeah. say um, people that even even people that aren't really into horror games, this isn't like you know, horror veteran, soil your pants level of horror. Like it's, yeah. it's still, you're still with your friends. It's funny. Like you're going to be messing with each other and goofing off in the game. And it's, it's, it's more the, um, overall atmosphere. The like mystery. there, there are moments that will spook you or startle you or just that general atmosphere is creepy. And then it's also alongside you're hanging out with your buds, trying to solve a ghost mystery, turning off each other's flashlights and scaring each other around the corner. We're corners. the motherfucking Hardy boys. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it appeal, it can appeal to people who are fans of horror games and just anybody who 
isn't a fan of horror games. Yeah. So yeah. where Tom and Adam enjoy horror, I'm someone who doesn't dislike it, but I'm not mm-hmm. someone who ever actively seeks it out. Yeah. And I'm loving this game. It's a mm-hmm. great niche to be in. Also, um, to the fucking with friends, Adam, so when you enter a hunt phase, there's a visual sign of all the lights, including your flashlight, start to flicker. So once your flashlight starts to flicker, you know, okay, got to hide. Adam figured out how to fuck with other people's flashlights. <laughs> oh my God. So at one point, we're walking out of this house towards the front door, and we already explained like the stress of heading to a front door. Adam reaches up, grabs my flashlight, and starts flickering it <laughs> while we're walking to a front door. So all the equipment works whether you're holding it or it's like laying around somewhere like you can place equipment as long as you're looking at the thing and you're close enough you can hit the interact button to turn equipment on and off whether you're holding it in your hand or not and i figured out that if you get close to your uh, teammates you can click their equipment on and off in their hands so you can walk (laughs) up to somebody and turn off their thermometer or their flashlight or whatever that is so shitty (laughs) it's so awesome what are you talking about no, I mean, but, it's awesome, but it's shitty to but do the that mechan- to somebody. Yeah. I mean, but the mechanic is good because you can set equipment down and still use it while using other equipment oh. into your hands and stuff. Like, it, it opens Which, up more shameless, gameplay. Shameless plug. We describe a great scenario for that in the video coming out tomorrow for anyone interested. Yeah. Um, so, guys, yes. I got to share with you. I think the first ever 72-pin connector creepypasta Thanks to this game. All right. Oh, yeah. So I'm going to go full bard. I'm going to tell you a tale. So I apologize in advance. Okay. So we're playing Phasmophobia. We were in the farmhouse and a hunt started. It was clearly a demon. It kept attacking us all night. And I was playing in VR. Everybody else was pancake screen. Pancakes. <laughs> An attack happened in the room where we we figured out where the ghost was, right? So it's their room. Flashlights started flickering. Lights started flickering. And you hear a click because we had the back door. Like, there was literally an escape to the outside in this room, which was great. We hear it close and lock behind us. This thing starts chasing us. And, uh, yeah, we we do the standard thing. Like, some of us get in the lockers. I decide to... Uh, cower, you know, right next to the lockers and hope that it doesn't look at me. Um, And then we hear the door start rattling. And apparently it slammed shut. But for me, what happened is the door turned outside. Like, it only opens to the inside normally. It turned to the outside and then literally started spinning in 360-degree circles. Just on its axis. Spinning. Spinning. It then shudders, moves halfway into the wall, spins around extremely rapidly, and then flies outside. I'm freaking out. I've never seen this ghost power before where it literally destroys the level geometry. I didn't know ghosts could do that. We've never (laughs) seen it before. It was a bug, but it was consistent with the lore, right? (laughs) Yeah. So I'm freaking out. Oh, no, it's going to get better. Don't worry. So I'm freaking out. I'm like, holy shit, this is a fucking ghost power. What the hell is going on? I'm like, Tom, what are you talking about? And I'm freaked out. So I walk outside the hole in the wall to get outside away from the ghost. And Adam, I think it was you who said, Tom, what the fuck are you doing? You can't do that. They're watching me walk through a solid wooden door. To them, (laughs) the door is still there. To me, it's just a hole in the wall. So I'm walking away (laughs) just through a wall. I start streaming and I show the guys. I'm like, look at this. Look, the, the door for me, it's it's totally outside. And it's literally mm-hmm. just hanging outside in the air. I'm like, oh, wow, that's a funny bug. So take some screenshots. We play a, a few more hours. Don't think anything else of it. Later that night, I'm going to my screenshots folder so I can post some stuff in Discord about it. Every single screenshot I took, the door was there on its hinges closed <laughs> Spooky. what the fuck <laughs> yeah that, I, I um that's nuts so that's actually pretty so nuts. today i was trying to get some footage of crucifix and work and i i did a lot of shit for it but at one point i had to 
ghost opened a door and it did exactly what you said, Tom, only it opened up the door and then the door slid in to where the hinge was in the middle of the door. <laughs> it was really fucking weird. And we got to hydrate this. Oh, shit. But, so, when we're playing the game and we're trying to gather evidence, it never fails that we get hunted. So I figured, I just want to see a crucifix disappear. So get, make a crucifix used twice. I sat in a room for 45 minutes and couldn't get a hunt to happen. 45 minutes sitting in the room. Couldn't get a hunt. <laughs> what the fuck game? It's like it knew what I was trying to do and it was just a big old fuck you. The game is haunted. The game is bullshit. No, but... <laughs> <laughs> I agree. I game, ha- game is haunted. Game is haunted. I haven't enjoyed a game like this, though, in a long time. Yeah, so. it's been a really nice find. It's cool. Uh, so, yeah, Phasmophobia, for any of those interested, I think it's like 15 bucks or something on Steam. Um, definitely totally recommended from all of us, if you're into that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, what else What else have you guys been playing this week? Spelunky oh. 2! Oh, yeah! How is it? Uh, it's good. Uh, honestly... I didn't get like super far into Spelunky. Like I played it casually, but that's about it. Mm-hmm. Did you ever um, unlock the shortcut? Like no. uh, level hop? Oh, okay. No, like like I, I literally played a very small amount of it. But like just from the small amount I've played, I don't see the difference in Spelunky 2. Like there's like a little bit here and there. There's like a nice uh, liquid physics system, which is kind of cool. So you can like drain certain flooded areas. But I honestly don't know what I paid for other than like small amounts of new content. Didn't they uh, make it uh, online multiplayer on this one? Uh, I don't know. I haven't tried it. Because I believe multiplayer in the first was local only. So I'm enjoying Spelunky 2. I, I think it's a good game. I just, it seems like Spelunky 1, but with a bit of polish. And I'm, I don't know how I feel about that for a full like sequel, right? It also, so, it's also a roguelike too, right? So yeah, you yes. don't know how much more content there is yet. Exactly. Right. So, this could just be most, played early. Like the Binding of Isaac when they did the rebirth thing. It was a remake of the first game in a different engine. But I mean, it was the game, but they added a bunch of new content. Mm-hmm. Um, Even if that original game existed, I feel that they added enough content for this to be a new game. Well, I'm, I'm for, speaking at Isaac. Oh, speaking Isaac. Oh, yeah. 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 Blunky, I never looked at the change notes or anything. Change notes, cheesy. The actual gotcha. notes about what was being changed or added. Yeah. So I, I can't speak to it. I just know I'm excited because I did enjoy Splunky. I never beat it, but I did play it. Uh, sounds like a decent amount more than what Tom did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, I, I don't so. think it's a bad game um, at, at all. I just, it's um, I, not as much of a change from Splunky 1 as I thought it would be. Uh, which I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about it. Hopefully you're just not far enough into it. Hopefully that if you keep yeah. playing it, it'll, that'll change for you. For sure. I, I don't, I think as a, I mean, I don't really care if if a sequel to a game is more of the same as long as it's more. Yes. Um, mm. But there's definitely an argument to be had that, hey, this thing isn't different enough to <laughs> warrant a sequel. Yeah, and I mean, don't get me wrong, like, it's beautiful, like, especially compared to Splunky 1, which was no slouch graphically, it was a pretty game, but mm-hmm. this, like, ups the ante, it's higher resolution, like, everything is hand-drawn, it is gorgeous to look at, um, it just, it's Splunky 1, but with fresh paint, is what I'm getting from it so far, as, as a non-Splunky superfan. I, I, I really dug it, but or the first one, but we'll see. I know uh, Ed or creative Isaac. Edmund McMillan. Blah. Yes, I always fuck up his name. Uh, he spoke very highly of this uh, recently in a tweet. He was saying about how he got a hold of it really early and he really, really enjoyed it. So, I mean, I'm looking so forward to it. So, hopefully, the general consensus is that this sequel is good and that maybe yeah. Tom just isn't too the, yeah. far enough into the game. Yeah. Game, hopefully. And he's someone whom, obviously, being creator of Binding of Isaac and stuff like that, I respect his decision, as well as he's outwardly spoken of being a huge fan of the first. Yeah. Yeah, so, I think, sure. like, the the one thing I've seen and, and read from Spelunky fans is that uh, they fucking love to. 
Like, it's the best thing to ever happen to them. Um, since I'm not a Spelunky super fan, or even, like, I guess a moderate fan, I don't know. It just doesn't seem all that different. Yeah, that's fair. Fair enough. But maybe maybe I sound like a mom in the mid-90s. Why do you need Sonic 2? You already have Sonic. <laughs> it's the same game. The blue one is in both. What do you mean you need a Super Nintendo? Don't you have a Nintendo already? What makes this I, one so super? I'm just trying to get you to buy all your games over again. So speaking of Sonic 2, actually, uh, Sega is having their 60th anniversary sale on Steam, and Sonic 2 is free right now on Steam. So if anybody played that as a kid and would like to play it again, uh, yeah, that's a thing. Or if you yeah. haven't played it, it's a fucking great platformer. It this, is, yeah. this could be... Uh, rose tinted glasses, but to me, Sonic 2 was always the platform for Sonic. Like, Sonic 1 laid the framework, but Sonic 2 is like the I like iconic. Sonic this yeah. is Sonic, yeah. um, I think so, anyway. I was more of a fan of three, but there's there's like big gameplay design differences between two and three. Um, one had a mix of like large sprawling levels and stuff you could just yeet yourself through. Mm -hmm. Two was all yeeting. It was all about the speed. It wasn't about exploration. Gotta go Just fast. run through, yeah, get through as fast as you possibly fucking can. And then three was all about these giant areas to explore, and it felt relatively slow to play. I like the big exploration levels. I think they work really well for Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles. But two had a better feel, if that makes any sense. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, like, Sonic & Knuckles, I loved it. I mean, I was one of the guys that... Drop two onto three onto Sonic Knuckles because I love playing his fucking Knuckles. Oh, yeah, everybody loves a and Knuckles Knuckle. mode. Yeah, Knuckles is cool. It's a cool character. Which, by the way, in Sonic Mania, there's a mode or an option called and Knuckles, <laughs> due to the meme that's you know whatever and Knuckles. Uh huh. Um, and it gives you Knuckles and his sidekick Knuckles <laughs> fighting to rescue Knuckles <laughs> from Knuckles. <laughs> that's great it's fucking that's awesome. great i love that sonic mania is the best of the sonic games i still don't or know yeah i don't have it either you should probably get it it's probably cheap uh, frankly i probably have a code laying around somewhere for it um it is if you want like a revival of the genesis era of sonic at all sonic mania is it like that yeah. that should have been sonic the hedgehog 4 it's that good and i'm glad that they finally have something that good because let's be honest the sonic franchise went it's the hell in a hand fucking, basket after the yeah it's not uh, i enjoyed you? sonic adventure at the time but that's not on my I got it's one not word on any of my top guys. 10 lists <laughs> one word shadow no i think he marked the fall of sonic shadow <laughs> the hedgehog i'm gonna say edgy. before that all of sonic's stupid fucking friends in sonic adventure ruined sonic I thought I thought the first adventure was actually pretty well. Wait, you didn't like fishing with the big chonky boy? Froggy. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah, I've had lots of practice. Like I forgot uh, what his voice sounded like, but when you did that, it <laughs> triggered the nostalgia. So I knew You're that you welcome. did it well. Tom doesn't. Tom never forgets. No, Tom never forgets. So what else have you guys been getting into this week? Uh, yeah. Tacoma. We have nothing to lose but our chains, comrade. The corporations are evil and bleeding us dry. Rise up and resist. It's still a yeah. narrative punch to the face. Yeah, yeah, there's there's no subtlety in Tacoma. I'm still liking it, but... Yeah, well, because it's your story. <laughs> that's that's all I've really got on it. And honestly, I don't even know like if I like the story like all that much. I don't know if I really identify with it or its messages, like... The, the message of maybe we should treat our employees better than cattle, it's like, okay, cool, who's going to disagree with that? But I don't know. The, the corporations are comically evil, which I guess <laughs> is, like, okay to look at, like, from an irony, analysis, satire standpoint. But yeah, I, I kind of feel like maybe a little bit more, like, the story being a little bit more grounded in reality could have helped it come off better. But, dude... You don't like know how these, bad some are, of these like, workers actually have it. They're like mustache twirlingly evil. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> like Dr. Robotnik started a factory. Yeah. Okay. So I don't, I don't so, want to spoil things. I'm not going to spoil things. Um, 
but like, just answer I, I, me yes or no. Is there a Robotnik in this? No. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, no, there's not a Robotnik in it, but the company wants to make similar arguments. Um, okay. I'll, I'll say that much. But yeah, it's it's like comic book levels of hilariously evil. <laughs> okay. Well, before we get off the Tom notes, I want to force him to talk about something in here a little earlier. Okay. Oh, shit. Early? Fine. Poker Stars VR added slot machines. I played it last night, and then I took a bunch of kids' money, and I got in a fight with somebody who's like, man, it's fake money, so why wouldn't I go all in every hand? I'm like, no, we're trying to play the game. You can't can't fucking do that. Like, you're, you're ruining I, Those people here. ruin free lobbies and online poker. <laughs> yeah, they do. Like, they just okay. fucking ruin it. Yeah, like, you're going all in. All right, so I've got a pair. I wanted to see what the rest of this is before dropping, like, virtual five grand. He's like, but it doesn't matter. It's all fake. Yeah. Yeah, but immersion. I know. Immersion. But we're trying to play. Please. He's like, but this is his cheapest table. I said, I, I can't convince this man. Like He's he, going all in on, like, a 2-7 offsuit. Like, what the fuck are you doing, kid? Although I, I did have, I, I did have something... Uh, interesting happened last night so this guy in granted this is like two in the fucking morning right like we're we're not gonna get the the adults of the world at two in the morning on a virtual vr poker game um, or you are it's just the degenerate adults of the world like me you know because i'm playing a vr poker game at two in the morning um but like one of the one of the this guy at the table said something like misogynistic or rude or something i forget i was drinking at the time i'll admit it um and I said, hey, man, that was kind of uncalled for. And he's like, yeah, bro, you're right. I'm sorry. It was weird. I've never heard that before in an online lobby. What the hell is happening to the oh, world? He didn't double down? <laughs> he <laughs> like, didn't double down? Yeah, what the fuck? I'm sorry, bro, you're right. And I That's responded, you have to get upset cool. at him for not doubling down. <laughs> yeah. Like, this is the internet, bro. What are you doing? So I responded with the only thing I could, which is, sorry, right, dude, shit happens. And then we, oh we, we like God. kept playing. Like, that's it. That's where the conversation ended. What a, the fuck? A civil disagreement on the internet? I, I it wasn't don't even know. a disagreement. With, it was, a, no, a civil disagreement with Resolve? Hello? There you go. <laughs> no shit. The hell with the internet? That happens anymore at all? Yeah, right? Yeah. Holy crap, man. That's cool. Well, no, I mean, I like hearing that, though. I mean, I don't like that he said that in, in the first place, but yeah, but the fact like, that you had he, a moment like that is, you know. Yeah, like he responded appropriately, and and he said, "You know what, man? I think you're right. Like it is, it is kind of not gel with the vibe of everyone else at the table here. Let me let me try playing for real." I'm like, "Oh wow, all right, sure." Hmm. And he did for a little bit. And that was fine. Like, I don't know. It was it was weird that it happened at all. <laughs> I'm still kind of flabbergasted. I don't know what to say. I got to a point with poker where it was hard for me to play not for money and not because I feel the need to gamble, but because it felt like then people played serious. Yeah. Yeah. Like exactly. if I could get a free table where everyone's trying to fucking win and rent win for real, I'm down. It's yeah. not the money aspect, it's the actual real competitiveness of it that I like. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I want to save my all-in card for, like, when I am really trying to bluff or when I've got something excellent that I just want... Mm -hmm. I want somebody to chase me on. Yeah. Uh, but, okay, now to what I actually wanted to ask you about. <laughs> oh, that wasn't the know. thing. Borders, Borders Gate 3. Yeah, I'm the worst How part. is this? What do I get for using wired headphones, guys? Hashtag Bluetooth. Oh, okay. so, let I me know. repeat everything. So now to what I really wanted to ask you about. <laughs> Borders Gate 3, how is it? I like it so far. I really like it so far. So uh, you can definitely see the uh, the engine influences from Divinity Original Sin 2. Larian has done a fantastic job of moving the D&D systems over to this engine. Um, one of my favorite things is that the skill checks, because in most other D&D video games that I've played, the skill checks and rolling the dice for anything is like located in like some fucking text combat log, right? It's like, oh, your character yeah. tried to roll for this. It failed. It doesn't make it front and center, right? And then when you're playing actual D&D, &D, 
you're rolling that shit and you're like, oh fuck, oh fuck, we gotta hit it. And everyone's like watching your dice. Like it, your dice are the pivotal like object to watch. And in the computer games, it's just never that way. It's just relegated to the same place that like all the other RNG in the game is relegated. It's well, just like, either, either hidden or like pushed off to the side somewhere. In uh, Baldur's Gate through or Baldur's Gate computer games, it would tell you that you fail to save and stuff like that. Yeah. But they didn't let you know that you were about to roll for one. Yeah, exactly. So Baldur's Gate 3, there are moments like there was a an intimidation check that I had to make. I'm just like, yeah, you want to fucking try me? I will tear your eyeballs from your skull, motherfucker. And a di- like a D20 comes up and it says, roll for persuasion. You're trying to hit at least a 13. And the, like the only thing you have to do is just click your mouse. But like the dice is big. It's on the center of your screen. Everything else is like kind of grayed out in the background. And that's how you roll. And you're watching the thing tumble. You're like, come on, come on, come on. You and actually you, roll. Yeah, yeah. You that's get, cool. Like, I mean, it's just a graphic, right? It's not like... Yeah, more, yeah, but, nice, but it's the idea that you're clicking a button. It's not just auto. Yeah, you're waiting there. Like, it's it's the same kind of anxiousness where you roll dice in D&D and you're waiting for it to come to a stop. You're like, did I make it? Did I make it? Did I make it? And then it hits a 16 and you're like, yes! Yes! <laughs> Fuck yeah! And the like the the screen fades out and the NPCs go. I think we're just gonna leave, <laughs> and they walk off. You're like, fuck yeah! It's like that same dopamine cycle of like loot boxes, but without having to yes. put money into it. Yeah. Do you exactly. have any? Do you have any pre-roll rituals? Like some people will blow on dice or like shake it a certain amount of times, or do you have? Do any you rub of- your finger nicely before you <laughs> click that button? <laughs> what, usually, usually what I do like in physical D and D games is uh, I will ask whoever's been rolling well that night for their dice. And if they aren't superstitious, they'll give them to me. But most people are like, no, Tom, you're fucking cursed. <laughs> I've seen people that had the idea that my 20 only has so many 20s in it. Yes. So after I roll like three 20s, I'm changing out my D20. Yeah. <laughs> D, like rolling straight 20s is a consumable resource. You only have so many of those in there. That's why there are some people who play D&D that don't, like, arbitrarily roll their dice. Like, they save it for real game time because they don't want to burn all those D20s they've got. Or those nat 20s. I, I just Which cannot is, understand that logic. <laughs> it's crazy because you typically think of people who play Dungeons & Dragons and stuff like that as smarter or smart people. Not smarter. That'd be kind of condescending, but... Intelligent people, typically. Like, that's a really headsy game. Hey, man, it's all, it's all that gambler's luck stuff. I mean, it's just uh, so. Uh, uh, come on, <laughs> that's all I can say. Come on. No, nah, no, nah, I believe in it. I believe nat twenties are a consumable. I mean, uh, I don't know. There are some smart people out there that believe some very stupid things. True, true. Like there are probably a decent amount of. Well, I don't know about that. I might be overshooting it. There might be a flat earther or two that are otherwise smart people. <laughs> no, <there aren't. laughs> oh, that's a that's hard one. To actually do. I might like, be pushing that one a little too make, far, but there are some that you could do reasonable arguments for. I don't think that's one you can. No, I, I don't know. But I, well, yeah, I get what you're saying, and it's a well put well put argument. Um, but okay, Tom. So. That rolling mechanic. Let's say you and I are playing together. Do I see it happen? Yep. Yes, you do. Okay, that's cool. It's so fucking cool. Oh, by the way. So, yeah, that's what I also want to talk about. There's like four things I want to talk about for Baldur's Gate 3. Um, So this is early access. The game is not complete yet. And what's interesting to me is that when large games come out and they say, oh, it's early access, what they really mean is we reserve the right to patch this, uh, but otherwise it's complete. That's not the case here. And it's not just the missing story content. Um, there are actual, like, when you're watching cutscenes, there are spots where, like, the voice acting will just drop out. Like, there's, like, they will be talking and speaking one line, and the next line isn't voiced at all. Like, they literally haven't recorded that shit. So you just have to read the text. Um, there are some cutscenes where, like, parts of it will be animated and others haven't been animated yet. So, like, you'll go from a beautifully animated cutscene to, like two characters standing and just looking at each other with like text lines underneath them. Yeah. Um, like it is, it is clearly an unfinished process or an unfinished product. 
but it's not bad. Like, if you know what you're getting into and you know that, okay, some stuff is going to be kind of jank here, uh, but otherwise it's perfectly serviceable, then yeah, that's that's Baldur's Gate 3 right now. Um, there were there was a nasty bug last night where Renee's character got locked into a dialogue, but she wasn't in dialogue. Like, she had a speech bubble above her head, but there was no, like, actual text on her screen. And when it, we tried to quick save, it said, oh, you can't quick save, you're in dialogue. This is oh, a bug no. and we're trying to fix it. And I said, okay, well, that's fine. We just won't quick save. We'll just wait till the next auto save and reload. Apparently, the auto save didn't warn us, but the quick save button did. So we lost a half an hour. Oh. Uh, and that's some enough really... to quit that night. Yeah, we did. We did. This was last night, and we were like, yeah, okay. We got some nice rolls. We put up with some bullshit, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll make that up later. Um, so yeah, it's it's buggy. It's definitely unfinished in pieces, but I don't think it's a bad game. It plays really, really well. Uh, and Larian, I think Larian is the perfect studio to pull something like this off. Um, they have clearly proven their worth in uh, computer RPGs with Divinity Original Sin 2 especially, and it's just fantastic. Also, the multiplayer, you can do LAN mode. So literally, I clicked LAN, I clicked set up game, Renee clicked the LAN tab, she double clicked my name, and that was it. There was no keys, no codes, no nothing, just playing the game. And if a, if a few weeks ago didn't teach us anything, Tom loves his land mode. I do love yeah. my land mode. Um, so yeah, you can you can play with up to four other people, and if you have multiple people, you can decide what party members they control. So let's say you've got you know two other NPC party members. You can say, okay, well I'm going to take the rogue, you take the wizard, and we'll just break it up like that. It works so fucking well. The whole system is drop in, drop out. It's seamless as fuck. We didn't notice any like weird networking issues or anything. It just is that fucking is, worked. Is that the same multiplayer system from that? Does it work similarly to uh, Divinity Two? Exactly. Yeah, it does. And like this is this is something where if you wanted a like drop in, drop out D and D game, like they don't even have to have their own character. They can, but they don't have to. So like Eric, if you wanted to play with us and just run the rogue. You can just join, and I'll drag that character over to you, and you're controlling the rogue. If you drop out, we don't even have to stop the game. If I want to turn a, like an offline game to an online one, I go to options and I open up the lobby. That's it. Like it is. That's awesome. Trivial that to get so started. Cool. It's amazing. So can someone play with you with a custom character, not someone from the actual? Like you and Renee started a campaign, so you both have custom characters. Yeah. Nice. Okay. You just have to set that up from the start. You can't I, drop in with a custom? I don't know. I haven't tried it. We should, but I'm not sure. Uh, and also, and I, we've hit this on an older cast as well. Um, for people familiar with both Divinity Original Sin 2 and the OG Boulder's Gates, this is a marriage where the combat style isn't that of OG Boulder's Gates. It's actually that more of Divinity Original Sin 2. It's more turn-based than it is yeah. real-time which I yeah. think is a welcome development. I think that's fine. Because in reality, anyone playing Boulder's Gate or whoever has understands, while it was more real-time, everyone used that auto-pause feature. And you pause constantly in combat. Yep. So yeah, this is fully turn-based. Um, you can even, like, when you're running around the overworld, you can turn on this optional turn-based mode, which throws everything into turns. So if you want that, like, pen and paper, people only move when they're supposed to sort of deal, yeah, you can you can do that. Um, I am loving this game, and just like a good D and D campaign with good D and D battles, you can get into some stupid bullshit. So there was a guy; he was a melee only character. We were we were squaring off against, and he was running up on uh, I think our wizard or something. So I have the ranger fire an arrow, pin him to the ground. He can't move. Then my tank runs up behind him and like smashes him in the back of the skull with the great sword. And you can set up those dynamics in just about every fight in the game. It is wonderful. I, I'm loving this. 
I'm my just, lack of buying it in early access is not a statement of my doubt of the game. It's my statement <laughs> of I'm not going to replay a game of that length to go through early access and I have to restart to see the content I missed. You want a full mm. binge. You don't want to take it piecemeal. Yes. Yeah, yes. I totally get that. Because like you said, you missed part of the voice acting and stuff. And 99.9% .9 of the times, that's fine. But there might be that gym of a cutscene that you're missing that you don't know you just missed. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's my reluctance on that. I have no doubt the game's going to be great. I still view this more than EA. I view it as early act, like a not early access, but a pre order bonus. Yeah. Because let's be honest, everyone who's buying an early access is because they were going to buy it full release anyway. Yep. Yeah. I probably. bought it full early access, didn't read anything because I'm a hypocrite. And also, I trust Larian. <laughs> I'm going to buy it as soon as it drops because I'm not a hypocrite and that's how I buy games. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Eric. No, there's certain games I get really excited about. I get a release and this is one of them because this is a childhood franchise of mine. I read in this franchise. I've played all sorts of games. So like I, I'm entrenched in this. I'm really excited. But yeah. Yay. Enough of that. Adam, you yeah. are also on some early access stuff. Um, no, never mind. Indie, no. indie, not early access. Yeah. Indie, more indie stuff. So it's um, you know, it's it's spooky season, right? It's it's time. It's October. Halloween is at the end of October. So I thought, uh, let's do something new. So after playing Phasmophobia a whole bunch, I wanted to play some more horror games. Um, so I bought. Uh, let's see. Well, first, we'll I'll go over the demo first. So I, I downloaded a free demo for this game called Bendy and the Ink Machine. Um, this one is really intriguing because it's a uh, first person, you know, typical kind of horror game. But the theme is like an old cartoon, like like Felix the Cat cartoon era. Okay. Not, not quite like, it's not the same visual style as Cuphead necessarily, but it does but that have era. that. Yeah, it does have that. Everything looks hand drawn, kind of cell shaded, borderlandsy a little bit, and then like the the main character Bendy is it looks kind of like Felix the Cat. Um, so the, this little demo is basically um, you used to work for this animation studio, and your old friend invites you to come to the studio, and you get there and nothing's working, and you're supposed to get this ink machine back together, and it has this weird like culty machine takes over kind of story thing it seems like so you have to like put this ink machine back together and then all of a sudden like the whole place is flooding with ink and you're getting these like supernatural events and um i don't know it's just mm -hmm. this really cool juxtaposition of this innocent cartoony art style with like actual horror game like uh music and imagery and stuff like there's this part where you walk into this room and there's this character. It's like it looks like Goofy, right? <laughs> Disney's what? Goofy, and he's like on this upright gurney, chained in, and like his ribs are sticking out, and he's dead, and he's covered in ink. And it's just weird. Like it's really cool, interesting though. So I'm thinking about buying the full game and checking it out because I, I love the style of that. That sounds very curious. Mm -hmm. It was interesting yeah. to watch that. The visual style was fantastic. Yeah, they really pulled it off. So I, I'm really I'm a big fan of of games that are a genre of game with like a not typical to this genre of game visual style. Like that, I'm really into that kind of thing. The type that say we're throwing it to the wall. We don't care. We're doing what we want. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that, that's interesting. Yeah. So I'll definitely, I'll probably end up buying that game at some point, but I didn't want to buy two games because I bought this other game. It's been on my wish list for a while called In Vivo. Um, definitely indie, another horror game, first person perspective, um, a little more action, also like action survival horror. Um, but this one is in the visual style of a PS1 game. So you've got your low polygon models, you've got your low resolution textures. Um, mixed with like kind of modern lighting where like there's actually reflections off the textures and stuff. 
Um, but the game itself is very disturbing. Um, it gives me kind of Silent Hill levels of disturbing vibes a little bit. Um, the sound is incredible. Uh, the sound made me very uncomfortable. And it's... I don't know how else to describe it. Tom, you watched me play a little bit of it. What was... Yeah, the the thing that you put in the title, which I have to agree with, is that yeah. the game explored claustrophobia yeah. in a way. And yeah, for sure. Yeah, it did. Like, you'd... Uh, you'll be walking down a tunnel and it'll just get thinner and thinner and more cramped and there's more bullshit in your way. And it's, it's not exactly a fun time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's, um, it's the brand of horror that gets to me the most, which is this like surreal, like really disturbing, weird off. Like it mm. almost, this sounds stupid, but it, it almost feels like the game itself is like evil you know what i mean like yeah. not just the themes within the game but like it feels like i shouldn't be playing this because it's demonic or something um yeah. so I, I hats off to like the developer Pokemon. of that game because you can tell it's a low budget indie game um but uh it definitely had me kind of kind of spooked kind of on edge unnerved a little bit um, so hats off to them. And yeah, it does I say think... in the description of the game, I remember it does say that the game is literally about claustrophobia. So okay. there are there are tight corridors. There are feelings of, I got to get out that you can't get out. Um, panicky, chasey moments where you're trying to, to use what little ammo you have for your guns to, to fight these monsters. Like there's this one segment of the game where... I have to get to from one end of this area to the other, and it's all these really, really tight corridors, like maybe enough room for two people side by side corridors, maybe less. Um, and you and you have to get to this other end of the thing, but there are these monsters who, by the way, don't have to walk within the confines of those corridors. They just like float through the walls straight at you, and you have to navigate these like narrow corridors and and fight them at the same time. It's very, very effectively unnerving. unnerving. But then you get to the end of this hallway and there's a lock. And the lock picking mechanic is hold <laughs> F until it get, finishes the lock picking uh, timer. So you're like, okay, hold F. Come on, unlock, unlock, unlock. You can hear this enemy coming and they're coming through the wall at you. Unlock, unlock, unlock. Ah, crap. You have to abandon the animation to fight the monster and not die and then you try it again and maybe you have time, maybe you don't. Um, it's just, it's very. It's old school, uh, PS1 era style, which is cool. It's disturbing. It's uncomfortable. It's intense. Uh, I really like the game. I really think the uh, the PS1 aesthetic works in that game's favor. It, it does because it's like it's creepy, but it's not it's not realistic. Like it won't let you figure out what the thing is you're looking at. Like yeah, I imagine the first time playing Doom. Like when I played Doom when I was a kid, those monsters were scary because your head makes up what they really are, right? There's mm -hmm. there's only so much fidelity you get from those pixels. Yeah. Um, and this works the same way. Like, is that a doll? Is that a woman? Is she like beheaded? Is that a body bag? Or is yeah. that like a sentient sack of potatoes? Like what's, yeah. what's going on here? Yeah. Um, and your head, because you're in this horror environment, invents the worst possible outcome mm -hmm. of all those questions yeah yeah there was a segment where i'm walking down it's um it's in the sewers and there's all these grates but behind the grates are these monsters trapped in there and since the the models are so low polygon you can't tell what it is it's like this vaguely humanoid shape but not quite proportioned correctly with like one arm really big and then like does it have two heads or is that a lump on its shoulder is it like yeah. a bug thing or is it like the, a demon is it a like mutated human you don't know and like you said your brain kind of fills in the blanks and freaks itself out it's really cool this is this is why i love the indie horror space is that you can do things like this and i'm glad you talked about that because i was just about to say i don't know if a low fidelity horror game would actually work for me at this point but given what you said it would actually make more sense though yeah yeah, it's not it's uh, it's not going to be as I don't want to say immersive, 
but I mean, it's not going to feel as real as, you know, Resident Evil 7 or any game with like a, you know, realistic visual style. But yeah. that doesn't mean it's not creepy and unnerving and weird and disgusting and all of the all of the things that you might want to see in a horror game. Yeah. I get you. I'd be curious to see what how you would uh what you would think about it, Eric, because it's not your style of game. And like you said, uh, the, the low fidelity visuals you don't think would affect you that much. I'd be curious to see how it would affect you or if it would. Yeah. I'm curious as well. Cause like, I'm, I'm not immune to elements of horror. Oh no. Like if anything, Fla- phasmophobia has exposed that when I went to my knees in VR when I first saw Dude, that something. first night we played that I was surprised because I'm like oh Eric's gonna be you know stone cold killer no no uh, uh no fear and I could tell that you were like on edge and like scared and stuff and it was cool VR dude still... VR is the demon when it comes to horror games <laughs> yeah I'm sure I, I can only which, imagine which is still like so so much more like under control than i am like i'm hyperventilating i'm freaking out like it hits a 10 and i'm just in the truck i'm screaming 10 10 guys it's a 10 get the fuck out of there like i'm uh-huh. breathing heavy walking into the house like okay all right we're just gonna put this down we're just gonna put it down and then maybe maybe it'll writen it and then we can leave and then and then i won't die and then, oh my god it's coming <laughs> okay i gotta call this out tom you're breathing is the worst thing in the world in that game? Oh my god! It sounds yeah. like yeah. the fucking ghost breathing right behind mm-hmm. you. Yeah. Yep. It does. You're the but worst. Yeah, um, I was talking to a friend about horror stuff because he was talking about how, um, like horror movies or games or whatever, like just don't affect him. Like he doesn't, he doesn't feel the the fear or understand the enjoyment of that that feeling or whatever. And like a lot of the for a horror game to affect you obviously the game itself has to be immersive and scary but there's also the responsibility of the person playing it like you have to be willing to be vulnerable and get into it and suspend your disbelief a little bit and yeah let it happen like there has to be a state of mind yeah you can you can go into any horror game with all the lights on in your house and talking to somebody or something and going into it like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to get scared by this. And you're playing it and you're, you're not, you're not in it, right? You have to be in yeah. it and you have to let yourself be vulnerable. Uh, a weird similarity I feel is comedy. Um, like if you go to a standard comedian, like they're going to tell you some fucking tall tales and you mm-hmm. just have to strap in and go with it. Yeah. If yeah. you're going to like nitpick and try to pull out all the shit that's not real or couldn't have happened, uh-huh. you're not going to enjoy your time at a fucking well, comedy Well, actually, club. this joke about Superman's incorrect because in the 47th episode of The Incredible <laughs> Superman in 1960, Get the fuck out of here, Tom. I'll cut you okay, off. I know yeah. you're waiting for someone to cut you <laughs> off there. Um, How long would he have like, gone if we didn't interrupt him? <laughs> Next time uh, we're gonna let him keep going. <laughs> no, no, I don't. I don't have that much improv material. I basically got like 15 seconds worth. Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, so I like I kind of put him in the same vein where yeah, you. So there's a certain amount of it on you. As not mm-hmm. to say that a game just can't be bad and whatever. Yeah, but mm-hmm. there there is a responsibility that if you want to actually try to enjoy it, open yourself to the game. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But so. Anyway, um, continue on. I guess. Yeah. I played um, some in that games. case, Tom, tell Hades. us about command line drone control. No, I'll tell you about okay. Hades. Huh? Tell us about Hades. Tell us about Hades. Uh, it's, it's cool because the, the game really wants you to play in different ways. And the way it incentivizes that is it's like, hey, you haven't used this weapon in a while. You'll get... <laughs> 20% more MacGuffins if you use this one. <laughs> MacGuffins? MacGuffins? Yeah. What is MacGuffins? That sounds like a fucking currency out of Rick and Morty or something. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, you get like 20% extra of one of the in-game currencies if you use like certain weapons that you haven't used in a while. So mm-hmm. the game actively incentivizes you to try to play in weird different ways. And you know how like in some roguelikes when you start to have a bad run, it's just like, okay, I didn't get this item. The run's basically over. There's nothing I can really do to pull this back. I guess I'll just die early and start over. Mm-hmm. Like, have you guys ever played a roguelike like that? Like, yeah. I've gotten um, that point. There were challenges. Like, I don't yeah. have. Yeah. There were challenges in Isaac where 
um, you're playing with a certain character with certain limitations, and in order to get a sex- successful run with that character, you have to get you know X and Y item within the first you know one or two levels or whatever. And yeah. while trying to farm that challenge, I would get to a point where okay, I'm you know two levels in, I don't have any items that are gonna be viable long term. It's time to just cut my losses, start over, and you know better luck next time. So yeah. absolutely, yeah, I, I understand that so, for sure. In Haiti, it's, I've never actually encountered uh, that. Like, usually when I'm getting, you know, quote, the wrong items or something different than what I had planned, um, it forces me to change my play style. Like, okay, so I used to dash around everywhere when I got Athena's thing because it protects me, but now that I don't have that and I've got Zeus on this cast, let's just go cast heavy and then it, it modifies your future run or your, your future builds mm-hmm. because you're just trying to build off of what you have instead of what you really want. Um, yeah. Which is mm-hmm. really cool. It, it forces you to, uh, or not forces, it nudges you to play in a new, different, possibly more fun way that you haven't encountered before because mm-hmm. it can. I, I love it. Yeah, there's a big yeah, difference between like, um, like encouraging uh, learning a new aspect of the game rather than just forcing the player to use this thing that they may or may, may, or may not want to use. Like, yes. There's still the option, right? You, don't, you didn't have to go with that style and get more stuff that uh, synergizes with that strategy. You could have just slogged through what you wanted to do you know, with limited tools and uh, non-ideal conditions but the fact that you still had that choice makes it feel like you're not just being strong-armed into something you don't want to do yeah that makes me think a lot of like slay the spire we're like isaac there's not like a variation of play you can really do too much i mean there's some choices you can make but by and large there's not a whole lot of variation in style but something like slay the spire i feel what you're saying 100 percent you start off the first couple floors getting these items like, I'm going to build my deck around this. And then all of a sudden they start giving you everything else. So you just have to adapt your deck later floors. I don't know, Eric. I think in in Isaac there are enough items that drastically change the way that you attack that change (sighs) significantly. But Are are you doing a mom's knife run? Are you going to do a high damage regular bullet bullet hell run? Are you doing the thing where your bullets turn into bombs? You don't get a choice though. The items dictate what you're doing. Well, you can choose not to take the item. Okay, like, yeah. Like, like hey, cannot... this this item drastically changes my the way my attack works, and based off these other items I have, that might actually break my run. I'm not going to take this item. Let's just keep going. That's true. You have that. But I was getting more at, like, I guess that's true. That's true. I'll take that point. So I, so, I really want you guys to try out Hades at some point. So I, I really do think, especially since it's now been fully released, I think this is a roguelike you could really get into after we've burnt out Ghost Hunters. <laughs> that might be a bit. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> that might be a bit, and I still have games I already own that I need to play. And like I, I bought Outer Wilds a while back, and I still haven't touched it. And I know it's amazing, but I, I want to play. I that haven't one. gotten. I just haven't gotten to it yet, and I have you know, multiple games in my library like that, that I just need to play. And I haven't, I still got to finish the last of us too. And I got to get back to rogue squadrons or not rogue squadrons, just squadrons. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Actually, I was talking to uh, a member of our community earlier today. It's like, Hey Tom squadrons tonight. And I was like, yeah, maybe probably after ghost hunters. <laughs> uh, so I think there squadrons was bad... a nice cooldown game for that. There was some bad news relating to that where EA uh, came out and said they're not planning any new anything else for Squadrons. Like Ooh. it's it's a done as is game. Which Wait, is a little sad to me. I was hoping to see again? some more the Star it's, Wars. Oh yeah, like, okay. Space yeah. battle. Yeah. Yeah. I was really hoping for like some maybe uh, not maybe not even necessarily new maps, but just some couple more types of gameplay. Yeah. But for $40, I mean, I guess we got what we got, and I'm fine with it. I was just hoping for a little more. Yeah. Well, I should. I would have liked to have seen a little more. I still think it's a good value. I, I honestly, it's, I'm gonna eat these fucking words. Um, so where where I was super happy with EA for holding back their typical monetization strategy, 
I wouldn't be opposed to paid DLC for this game. I really wouldn't. Like an extra ship type or new maps or maybe a new multiplayer mode, like something. I would pay for it. Especially you since the game wasn't like 40 or was 40 bucks, right? Like it wasn't full yeah. price. So if they make the DLC like 10 a pop, depending on what you get, yeah, that sounds okay. Yeah, but you might fragment your community because you can't do maps. Yeah. Ships would cause balancing issues. Yeah. Yeah. Game modes you can't really do because you'd split your player base. Kind of a slippery slope into Battlefront 2. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I, I get it. So here's what it is. Um, but Tom, you had one more game that was actually yeah. interesting. Like I, I was actually intrigued by this. Tell us about Roomba Roguelike. Roomba, <laughs> Roomba Roguelike. Space Horror uh, yeah. Space Roomba. <laughs> space Roomba, the horror. There game. it is. Um yeah, so I only played this because Adam said, Hey Tom, do you ever play this this game where you like type into a command line and control robots on a derelict spaceship and it's a roguelike slash horror game. I'm like, I would like to subscribe to your newsletter. Please tell me more. <laughs> um, so Adam said, try out Duskers. I go to Steam. I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy this shit right now. Uh, yeah, I, I owned it. I don't know how. <laughs> I, I, I actually found out about that game because I was on our uh, 72 PC YouTube channel. And it was one of the recommended videos with some guy saying it was like Duskers, the scariest game of 2019 or 2018 or whatever, whatever year it came oh. out. And I was like, oh, I'm actually looking to play some scary games, you know, before I played in vivo and stuff. So I, I looked at the game and I was like, this is not my cup of tea, but Tom will love this. I know Tom will love this. <laughs> so that's, yeah. that's how that started. So I'm glad so you like the, it. The premise of the game is that uh, you are in control of various drones. Um like, not like hundreds of drones, like three to start out with. Um, and the drones have um, different abilities. Like, one can, like, vacuum up scrap and fuel and collect resources. One can tow other objects. Another can, like, hack stuff or uh, use a generator to turn on lights or doors. Um, and the premise is that uh, your spaceship has, like, encountered some kind of tragedy you're running out of fuel, you're running out of supplies, you are not going to live for very long. And you have to use these drones to go find out other ships to see if one of them can respond to your distress signal, or at the very least, maybe you can just steal stuff and scrap stuff from the abandoned ships so okay, you can space stay pirate. alive longer. Yeah, yeah, quite literally space pirates so you can survive. Um, and the game, it's really weird. Like, you get you can control the drones through the arrow keys just one at a time. But it's really inefficient because you're you're sitting there, you're controlling everything by hand, and you're con you can only control one drone at a time. The game has a command line interface, which it heavily relies on. So I can type navigate 123R4, and that would navigate drones 1, 2, and 3 into room 4. I can also use things like D1 through whatever to open up that numbered door and you can scan for enemies the enemies like if you get caught you're basically fucking dead like there's at least early game there's not much you can do to fight back um so the game is a big uh exercise and okay i'm gonna turn on my motion sensor here shit this room is compromised let's open these doors and herd this enemy into this room then check with the motion sensor again to make sure we actually put them in this room then lock the doors behind them, make a mental note to never go in that room, and then explore the rest of the ship to, you know, sell everything off for scrap or steal their fuel. And it is really, really fucking cool. Um, if, if you have ever been at work as a Linux sysadmin and you need to type really quickly because there's shit that's on fire and it's your job on the line... Yeah, this game will give you very similar feelings. It literally felt like I was in a high severity issue trying to fix things on a command line. Uh, and it was so fucking cool. I really, really like this game. Um, like, you can get uh, extra abilities by literally just reading the help pages about the commands. It's like, oh, I used help gather. 
and it shows me, oh, there's an optional all flag that I can attach to this. So my Roomba will go around oh, and suck up all the scrap in a room. But it does require you to do the command line things like, hey, maybe I should use the dash dash help flag here so I can see what I'm actually doing. Um, it's cool. It's cool. You'll find uh, other like derelict and broken drones that if they're not totally broken, you can actually tow them back to your ship, repair them and get a free drone. Or you can just strip them for parts. So if one of them has like a generator, you're like, oh, cool. I've only got one of these. Now I've got another generator and I can power two rooms at a time, um, which is really, really cool to see. So yeah, um, I guess in relation to that video I saw, how spooky scary is this game how tense is it um so the the one enemy i encountered it was just a drone and it killed me um i didn't get too spooked the game has the the ability to scare you like it was it was definitely like a slight jump scare like ah fuck ah no i'm dead but it's not any different than what you would get in any other game where you're surprised by an enemy Mm -hmm. um that said i haven't gotten too far into it so it might get scarier I was going to say, I um, thought, I thought yeah. in the trailer I saw some enemies that were like vague red blob alien things. So I don't I didn't know if they if you'd run into any of that yet or not. No, not yet. Uh, but I'm, I'm also trying to not run into the enemy. So I don't really know what they <laughs> look like because yeah. I'm hurting them into rooms or into turrets. Like mm-hmm. there was there was a, a part uh, yesterday when I was playing this game where I turned on um, one of these turrets is a ship defense turret inside of one of the rooms went around the other rooms grabbed as much scrap and fuel as i could huddled my guys into a corner and then just opened the door and let the enemy walk into that uh that turret area where they got slaughtered or so i thought only (laughs) one of them was killed and the other one was still in there and fucking marked me afterwards which was great um funny (laughs) But yeah, I'm I'm actually really enjoying this game. I'm going to play more of it, but it is a very uh, peculiar game, right? If if the idea of controlling drones through a command line does not sound appealing to you, you're probably not going to like this game. Um, but if it does, yeah, this is basically the best thing we've got since uh, Zork, since the, the Matrix video game hacking challenge. Like, <laughs> it's a nice so... command line. Also, tab completion, and that's how you know they're doing a good job. So I thought the game looked enjoyable. I think I could enjoy it. All that said, I don't see how anything about that could be horror. I get the suspense the of, like, I don't creepy. know what's going to happen. Yeah, like, in, but there's is two parts of the game. Like, the view when you're controlling your drone, where you've got a very limited field of view, very limited vision, color palette, stuff like that. Yeah, I could see that being being scarier. But the other one where it's just a map and you're looking at like, okay, D two through five and then room uh, one through seven. Okay. That's, there's not really much scary that can happen here. Oh shit. A red square. Um, exactly. That's kind of what I was getting at. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's it. I guess later on in the game, if the, the like in it control, the drone view gets too scary or if it's really tense, that that like overall map view is kind of your reprieve yeah i don't know which is like but i think it might have been a missed opportunity because in the command line view i'm never looking at the drone's camera right i i need all the information at my fingertips so i'm just using the map view Hmm. and that's where i think i would be spending all my time because you can control so much better that way yeah it's more efficient you get way more information uh so why wouldn't you hmm maybe there's eventually times when you have to do the drone level but eh, who knows yeah. but definitely keep us updated though if you play more yeah, yeah. I'm for curious. sure i am very curious about this so what and else have you guys been I've, into have you played any other games I, I did some more mario 35 i got a lot further like i had a run where i think i played for probably about 10 minutes and still only got fourth place oh jesus like it was an insane run where I'm like, how are these people still going? <laughs> I noticed that when spectating a Mario 35 match, I'm like, how, how do you even finish one of these things? Like, like I, I can't imagine the- for 15 minutes. Like, 
sitting there with five people left. I don't, I don't know how you do it. Yeah, I don't know what the time to completion would be on that because Mario doesn't intrinsic intrinsically have a ratched up difficulty like uh, Tetris does. Yeah, like Tetris has it built in. The longer you go, the harder it gets to a degree. So Where I don't, Mario I don't know, doesn't. I don't know how far you got into it, but I did notice that when it was like after I don't know ten minutes, fifteen minutes of people just sitting there and not dying, the game started like super ramping down your time. Like you've always got that timer clicking down to your death, but like it started doing multiple points per second. Like, five. well, they, they had to because the, the mechanics of the game. Yeah. Um, there's so many more enemies. You're getting so much more time. So they have to chew the time. Oh no. I mean like it, it rapidly increased the clock speed. Like well, it was kind of a sudden death thing. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I didn't get to that. Increased. Yeah, go ahead and, and spectate one of the matches and, and you'll see what I'm talking about. It's uh it's kind of harrowing. I don't I don't think I could survive that if the clock got to that point. Yeah, it's it's just nuts. Like I was just spamming my fire. I had over 100 and some coins so I could use the roulette continuously. And then I got trapped or I missed the jump is the only reason I died. It wasn't enemy based. Oh, so I was really upset about that. But that's my time with Mario 35. And that's all I've got this week because Phasmophobia was my week. Yeah, <laughs> same. I played those other two games briefly today and that's, that's been about it. And a, a very slight and bit of Rocket League. I think Adam and I did a tournament Yeah. with... Uh, who did we do a tournament with? Was it Ty or... It was someone was GC. Might have been Ty. I can't remember. But we did a tournament with someone and we didn't win. So it didn't Acro. matter. <laughs> Acro, yeah. Um, oh, um, do we want to do, uh, we, uh, do we do the, the top plays? Oh yeah. I forgot. It's that time of month. It is. Um, actually should we, uh, uh, yeah, not that time of the month. Um, let's, let's filibuster for a second. So Adam, how about you tell us what we're about to do? Oh yeah. So we're going to play the top plays of the month. These are plays from our community. Um, every day we pick a play from the community and we put it on our Twitter. And then at the end of the month, we gather the 10 best clips that we've gotten submitted and put them into a little montage for you. Um, these are any gameplay clip. Most of the time, they end up being Rocket League because we're a pretty Rocket League-focused community. But any game works for these. Um, if it's not an amazing play, if it's just something funny or interesting, we post those on the Twitter too. They may not make the monthly montages, but uh, feel free to submit any of that stuff. Um, our Discord links are down below. If you want to join the Discord, we have a Plays of the Day channel. You can post all your clips there. And if you do gift your game clips for Rocket League, please, please save and favorite your clips so that when we go to put this montage together at the end of the month, your clip isn't disappeared into the void of, of the gift your game servers. I can't hug Adam hard enough for what he just said. Everyone <laughs> save your fucking clips. There's so many. Like there was three I'm, people that their best clip of the of the month yeah. was disappeared and gone. Yeah. By the time it was over. Yeah, it happens unfortunately, uh. and I'm I was guilty of it too. The this month, I remember to save my clips I made today and yesterday though. So that's a plus. Damn straight you did. <laughs> so uh. um, Eric, if that if that uh if everything's ready to go, I'll go ahead and flip the scene and let, let's take a look. Let's roll that beautiful clip footage. Yeah. Gildan Giraffe to start us off. And I think she has like five of these a month where she hits these Damn. stupid low I, angles. I love those. I love those types of shots. Those are so fun. Just like sniping it back into their own net. Well, and this one was from up on top, which yeah. is even better. Yeah. Joey. 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 Another. With the uh, Fortnite Octane. Oh, I didn't even notice that. <laughs> it's like, it's I like love this spike. I, I feel the hatred in this spike. Like, he looks at the goalie and just throws it at him. <laughs> like, oh, are like, oh, you dude. down there? Oh, yeah. You're Fuck not going to get this in time. Not at that speed. Kira. Okay. Impressive thing about this clip. Look at the time. And this was in day two of the RLCS regional qualifiers. Jesus. Oh, wow. So that's a big fucking shot. Yes, what it is. Badass. And a good read, too. 
Hey, hey. Hey, it's you. It's Eric. No, I'm calling shenanigans on this. You can't pick yourself. You can. Look at it. I Look at the clip. Myself. All right, I'll allow that. And this was with Tom. No <laughs> I love Both how you just... Scott and I, uh, I love how you just, like, sandwich the puck between you and the other guy to be like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm going to take it from here. <laughs> like it goes this way. Polar Axe. Polar Axe. Oh, my God, the pinch. With a nice pinch. And then... Oh, I love his car really, movement there. Really clean. Very Such clean. A clean double. I, I love the way the Dominus looks when you're like really finessing mechanics like that and turning the car a certain ways. Very no cool car shot. looks better on rotation. It's a great a angle too. Spaghetti. Spaghetti. Oh, on the ceiling. Oh, very the odd. <laughs> Interesting. What? what is that? I like it. I don't think I've ever seen this in a ceiling shot. He's like, my home is the sky. This is where I belong. The ground is no place for me. Cathod with another one. Okay. And the Dom GT. Shout out to the Dom GT. It is a pretty car. That is such a dirty pass. Oh my God. <laughs> such a dirty pass. Just, once again, look at the time and look at the score. Such oh, a dirty yes. pass. Right off I, the front of the I car. I love a good pass. Shots are great, but I love a good pass. Hey, Fitz. It's Fitz, our mechanical wizard. <laughs> In the Merc this time. With the Merc. Big old van. Just dishing him out. <laughs> Getting a reset with the Merc. Man, I hope this makes it to the pro scene. I want to see the Merc back. I Agreed. know. The Merc. But it's a really pretty reset. Oh, bears. We got, we got bears. 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 Beats. Battlestar, Battlestar Galactic. Galactic. I can't speak today. Oh, look at this. Oh, my God. Okay. Pretty okay. Pretty reset. I see you. <laughs> like, I struggled. This almost took number one. One, two, three. Reset. With the Four. reset. Oh, Jesus. That's dirty. And then Slugger. Speaking of odd ceiling shots. Slugger, oh, backwards. The backwards Slugger. wave backwards dash wave on the dash. ceiling. Oh, God. Okay. Yes. This, I believe, too, is Slugger's uh, <laughs> debut first place uh, monthly montage win. Yes, it is. Oh, my God. That, and deserved. That's a fantastic shot. That's Excellent insane. job. insane. And thanks to everybody for submitting, too. Yes. Um, wow. I go through these clips every Sunday. Every clip you submit will get viewed. So Nothing goes unviewed. If I have a clip, where can I submit that? Tom wasn't paying attention earlier. Let's go to the Discord. Yeah, I, I was. I just want to <laughs> make sure. Go to the Discord, drop that sucker in place of the day. But before you do that, open your gift gear game and hit the save button. For the love save of God, hit that save button. <laughs> Please. But yeah, that was rad. Um, I was I was doing uh, those on Sunday. I saw that clip. My jaw fucking dropped. I'm like, holy shit, this is such a weird ceiling shot. Because we were just discussing the fall of the ceiling shot and how it's you rewind a year ago going through plays of the day, probably a third to a half of our shots were ceiling shots. It was ceiling shots and dirt nasty flicks. Now the ceiling shot's gone, and it's been a lot of resets. And even more recently, we're starting to see more of the air dribble bumps. And uh, just the ceiling shot is a thing of the past. So I love that we had so many ceiling shots this month. It made me yeah. feel real good. <laughs> Great clip submitted this month for sure. Okay. So what am do we I, have? What? Am I the only person that really hates the air dribble bumps? Like no. I, I don't do them, and I, I know I could never defend against them, and I know I'm bad at Rocket League, but I just it it seems like an annoying mechanic. Like I, I get <laughs> yeah. it. Like it's but, effective, but kind of lame or boring or something yeah exactly like it, it's not this i don't want to say it doesn't take skill because it absolutely it takes skill to yeah. be that fucking it takes accurate. a lot of skill and it's risky but, because if you miss yeah. that bump you're in a bad spot especially well, in like a 1v1 like situation that, that one mechanic is super overpowered well and it didn't in my eyes like i'm not a super pro hawk but it didn't really make it onto the scene until the fusion tournament this summer yeah, because that's, that's when ones took a huge scene. Yeah, out since the world of rockets has really stopped their thing. So I think that's when we started seeing the air dribble bump really make its way into standard games. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I agree. Fucking first killer. <laughs> but no, um, the, the the shit's effective, so I can't blame people for doing it. It's just it's not fun to watch. Yeah. But every once in a while, enough of that. You, you fellas want to get into a little bit of news, and yeah. by a little bit of news, I I mean actually, just, actually a little just, bit of news from what I can see from the show notes here. <laughs> Literally yeah. two stories. Okay. Yeah, let's get into so, it. So, Tom, I'll let you lead off of story one since um, it's kind of a for explanation on last week. Yeah, so uh, last week we talked about the Avengers game and how uh, Deus Ex Human Revolution, a game that came out fucking forever ago, um, had way, way, way more concurrent players than we're playing a brand new AAA title on Steam. Um, like that, that game just hasn't been doing well. And in that news, uh, yeah, the concurrent player base actually dipped below 1,000 players concurrently Ooh. playing the Avengers game. And uh, it caused some pretty major issues for matchmaking. Like, people couldn't actually get into matches because there weren't enough people playing. Oh, Which causes sucks. less people to play. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a very quick downward spiral, I'm sure. Yeah. It's just problems that lead to more problems that lead to more problems. Yeah. Which leads uh, to a game dead after six months. Yeah. Have yeah, you guys like, watched any gameplay of it? Like, does it yeah. even look fun, or does it look bad, it's, or what's how does it's it work? It's a perfectly serviceable beat 'em up. Like, there's yeah, there's not much to it, right? Like, if Destiny is a perfectly serviceable generic first person shooter, the Avengers is a perfectly generic beat 'em up. Mm -hmm. Like, there's really not much to talk about. The gameplay but is fine. Like, it's boring, but it's fine. It doesn't take I've... any risks. I found myself not enjoying beat em ups anymore. I'm wondering if there's been a wider shift where people find the genre a little boring anymore. Um, it could, it it could depends be. on I mean, the beat em up for me. Like, if uh, beat em ups to me aren't a game, they're not a lifestyle game, right? Like, I will play the fuck out of some Streets of Rage one, two, three, and four. Like, I fucking love Streets of Rage. I love Double Dragon, but they're two hour games. Like, you get like an hour, hour and a half, two hours of, of run out of a, a single completion. And that's where you stop. Like they're not meant to be these big ass. I'm going to play this forever lifestyle games mm -hmm. because the gameplay just gets really boring. And I don't think there's anything wrong with a game like aiming to be short. Streets of Rage is a fantastic series because it knows what it is with the Avengers trying to be like this big lifestyle game where you're expected to dump, you know, 20 hours a week into this thing without a whole lot of like interesting or deep content or mechanics, it doesn't really work. And the, from what I've heard, the gear treadmill isn't even like good enough to have that Diablo esque. Oh, I just have to keep playing. So I get Hulk's purple pants. Like the gear is not even interesting enough to, to grind for. That's unfortunate. That in the, the monetization and basically everything around the game that's not the game itself has just been a tire fire since day one. Uh, no gusta. Don't like to hear it. Yeah. Uh. Like all the, all the reviews say this game is fine. It's it's boring and definitely safe, but it's it's fine. It is what it is. It's fun and then for they a say night or two. Once, yeah. Once once you add in like everything around the, the games as a service model and the lifestyle game concepts and the monetization, and all the microtransactions. That's what really ruins the experience because the game itself, there's not a whole lot wrong with it. Not a whole lot. Great, but not a whole lot wrong. Mm -hmm. It's everything else around it, which is unfortunate. It's, it's another, another case of fucking business decisions and, and bean counters ruining what would be a perfectly serviceable title. Would it be better maybe as like a single player game that isn't going to be reliant on multiplayer matchmaking? See, I don't know. Because the game is kind of boring. I mean, you could probably put, I don't know, 20 hours into it, but that's it. And for a for a full $60 title, I don't know if that's mm -hmm. enough anymore. Yeah. That's fair. Unfortunate, but fair, I guess. Yeah. If people don't if like it, I mean, people aren't going to play it. And that's if you're what looking happens. for a beat em up and you don't want to spend a lot of money and you just want to play for two hours with some friends, Streets of Rage 4 is fantastic and I can fully recommend that. Um, yeah, that's what I got. All right. And there's only one more thing of news. And this is a rehash 
of last year. Huh? See what I did there? Um, <laughs> oh, oh. I don't get it. So I don't get it. EA released FIFA 21 Legacy Edition for the Switch. And it is FIFA 20 from the year before. I don't mean it's virtually just like the Madden complaint where it's almost the same game. No, it's the same fucking game. So, which is funny because if I remember correctly, FIFA 20 was literally the exact same game. Not again, not like the standard complaint of all. Oh, they didn't really change anything. Like literally FIFA 20 was the same game as FIFA 19. Yes. So what did IGN think of this, Tom? So IGN decided to, uh, put as much effort into their review of FIFA 21 as EA did into FIFA 21 itself. I'm going to quote directly from the IGN article. Seeing as EA copy and pasted last year's FIFA onto the Switch again this year, once again saying it has the same gameplay without any, quote, without any new development or significant enhancements, unquote, on its store page for the full price of $50, I've decided to do the same and copy and paste my review of FIFA 20 on the Switch below as my review of FIFA 21. And it's literally word for word with FIFA 20 replaced with FIFA 21, the same review IGN put out last year for this year. (laughs) It is the classiest fuck you I have seen in years. (laughs) I love it. It's great. I love the pettiness. What's shitty? Is EA used to do something really rad where if you had like Madden 2014, they had a deal, or I don't remember if you have to pay for it. They just did roster updates, mm-hmm. live roster updates. That's all this is. That used to be something they gave you. And they're literally charging $10 less than a brand new title. And, and let's be clear, there is competition, right? There, there are plenty of games out there where enterprising independent fans are taking old school ROMs and hacking in their own roster updates. Do you want to play tech mobile with the 2020 NFL roster? You can, it's out there. I, I do life. think <laughs> I, I remember back in the 2012 reboot of 72, Brent and I played the super bowl against each other on a modded up tech mo with the teams. Yep. So yeah, that kind of stuff does exist, but it's a fun story, fun happening, and I think that's all we got. That's all I've You guys got. have anything you want to get out on the way out? Uh, yes. Coffee is delicious. Okay. I, I agree. Yeah. True Double statement. okay. And I, I'll, I'll put a third stamp on that. And also, I'll give us a rundown. So, for those of you watching us on Twitch, we appreciate you. But we also have all of this stuff on YouTube, as well as clip highlights on YouTube and other various video segments that we've been putting some time into. Yes, actual original content is starting to go up on the YouTube. Keep an eye. Um, If you're over on the YouTube watching our whole podcast, damn, you're devoted. Thank you. Also, we are live every Saturday night, 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on our Twitch, which is 72 pin con- or twitch.tv slash 72 pin connector. So jump on over there, get in the chat with us. And just chill with us. It's a great fucking time. And then, you know, we have our Twitch, 72PC underscore official. Go up there, follow us there. All of our tournament updates, our top plays, and some various stuff. And then finally, that was a lot. Don't remember them. Go to 72PinConnector.com. It'll link you everywhere. Tom is almost done. We're almost live with the new site. The prettiness is almost there. (laughs) And ladies and gentlemen, that's all we got for you this week. I think I'm going, um, I'm going to commit the website to a release date, a Cyberpunk 20. Uh, sorry, a Cyberpunk release date. It is going to happen within the next year. Yay! <laughs> to to uh, the same delays that Cyberpunk was subjected to. So keep that in mind. <laughs> uh, shout out okay. to uh, Relentless. Thanks for the raid. Um, a, yeah. a little bit unfortunate on the timing because we're just ending the podcast unless we're going to play some games later on, on stream, maybe. We will be doing some stream games. Yep. Yes. So that will be a happening. So uh, with that, I think we're going to let you out of here with the uh, top plays. Yes. So uh, till next week, game on. Enjoy the montage. <laughs>